What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Bituation Room podcast live stream bonus episode for the Frantifa. That's right. If you are here, Andrew, Susie, Todd, Jen, Cosmos, it's because you're part of the Frantifa, all right? You are a patron of this podcast, and I'm so grateful that you're here. If you're listening in the future, um, you might also be a patron or you might not be, but if you want to become one, patreon.com slash habituation room. I'm so excited. We have none other than author and journalist Naomi Klein with us for the almost hour. Um, I'm super excited. We're going to talk about all the fun things like, you know, climate collapse and, uh, you know, how many years left we have to stop it all and radically completely change the economic system. But there's room for hope, uh, especially when Republicans um, just keep digging themselves uh, every kind of grave and trap that they have set up over many, many, many years. So thank you so much for being here. And I am also joined by my dear friend and uh, oft co-host, oft co-host, <laughs> comedian and labor organizer, Mr. R Nato Green. What's up, Nato? Hey, everybody. How are hey. you? Good. How are you? I'm all right. I, I, I just got momentarily distracted by people insulting me on the internet. Ugh. Uh, so. Is it is it about whiteness again? Please tell me it's not Nazi related. It's not. No, it's not Nazi related. It's uh, it's it's you know, there's uh, people who think I'm, I'm an asshole for uh, oh, have, oh, that's for having normal. opinions. Yeah. Oh, well, I think you're an asshole for having an opinion. So I mean, that's you're not wrong though. <laughs> <laughs> but we're friends anyway. <laughs> we are friends anyway. What I don't want to—I mean, as much as I love you, NATO, I'm—I'm I'm less interested in what you have to say today, and I'm more interested in what our guest has to say. Look, and that's the correct answer today. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> and she's been quarantining with her child, so we got to get to this. Uh, and I am super, uh, super glad to have her with us. Um, as to talk about all this, as we said, the uh, snowstorm in Texas buried the hand of the free market under six feet of snow, and uh, we don't want it to come back out. That's what we want. We want it to stay there. Um, she's an award-winning journalist, columnist, and author of eight books, all the ones that got you woke, i.e. me, including the New York Times and international, international bestsellers, No Logo, Shock Doctrine, This Changes Everything, No Is Not Enough, and On Fire, which have been translated into over 35 languages. Así que si estás mirando desde Latinoamérica o donde sea, no hay excusa. Um, Naomi's writing has appeared in newspapers and magazines around the world. She's a senior correspondent for The Intercept, Puff and Writing Fellow at Type Media Center, and the inaugural Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University. University, no big deal. She's the co-founder of the climate justice organization, The Leap, and her new book, How to Change Everything, The Young Human's Guide to Protecting the Planet and Each Other, has just been published. That's right. We're talking about Naomi Klein. Welcome, Naomi. Hi, Francesca. Hi, Nato. <laughs> I'm happy to be with you. Hello. Thanks for that nice intro. Nato, I just checked out what mean things people were saying about you on the internet because I was curious about who I was talking to. Oh yeah. Um, also I like I said I said some I said some I said some snarky things uh the other day about uh schools reopening and entitled white parents. And you know what? Entitled white parents do not like being told that they're entitled white parents. And uh there was a closed Facebook group that organized a campaign to attack me personally oh my for saying God. something about entitled white parents on the internet. Good times. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah Welcome so. to the new San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> There's whole like message have, boards. <laughs> don't they all have parent pods? What are they no. for? Ex that's exactly right. Um, Naomi, I just have to do the thing that some people do, which is when they say, I knew you when, and we knew each other when, but we knew each other when in 2004, as a young anti-capitalist, I helped organize the Life After Capitalism conference, and you were a keynote speaker at our inaugural event, and it was a week after the RNC, or before the RNC? Yeah, it was like right before the RNC, and Vijay Prashad was he, another guest speaker. Robin D.G. Kelly. Yeah, it was good. It was really good. It was like a New York police state. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was, I got arrested a week later and detained. 
And, and, uh, and it worked out. Now we're after capitalism. Good job, everybody. And now that we are after capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> so painful. Uh, no, we're still here. Yes. We're still... Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, was, that was an optimistically <laughs> named uh, little teacher. After... Wasn't it? It mm -hmm. was so visionary. And I feel like, you know, 10 years, 20... How many years later, 15 years later, we're like... We're just a little, our, I, at least my feet are a little bit more planted in the uh, quickly eroding ground. And I'm like, okay, no more dreaming. Let's do this. Let's get to work. Um, let's start a podcast. That's how you really, that's how you really bring it all down. But um, I'm so happy to have you here and thank you for, you know, your writing. Uh, still good, by the way. I'm not sure if you knew this. <laughs> Thank Still kind of crushing it. Oh, that's very nice for you to say. <laughs> no, of course. And you you have a, a new article out uh, just now. We've, we've been talking about the massive farmer protests in India, so I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, but you really had this op-ed in the New York Times that I loved, and it was all about the the disaster in Texas, essentially, when millions of people went without electricity. And that meant they were freezing and often, in some cases, freezing to death, uh -huh. standing in lines, doing all the things that were warned that socialism does. Uh -huh. But instead, you know, capitalism did this one. Can you just talk about, and this is a huge question, but how this like epic infrastructural and political failure and climate change coalesced? Like what were the how did they interplay in what happened in Texas? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think the first thing to understand is this isn't unique. This is the story of climate disruption in the rubble of the neoliberal project, right? So, um, you know, the argument I've been making for a while is that if we want to understand why we have not acted in the face of the climate crisis, it's this epic case of bad timing, right? That it hits the sort of public consciousness at the peak moment of there is no alternative, history is over. So like James Hansen, the famed climate scientist testifies uh, on Capitol Hill that he can now say with a 99 degree level of certainty that humans are, are warming the planet in 1988. So the, the, the Berlin Wall is about to fall. Francis Fukuyama declares history over. It's like the ascendant moment of the project, right? And so if you think about what you need to do in the face of the climate crisis to avert it, you need massive investments in the public sphere. You need to tell businesses what they can and cannot do. You need to regulate them. You need to nationalize some of them so that you can um, have control over how we get our energy and how we move ourselves around. It's a big project and it requires that kind of a response. It hits in the moment where we're privatizing everything, we're deregulating everything. The whole idea of planning anything is, um, you know, uh, basically unsayable in the public sphere. And so that's why we did, well, that's why we didn't act. I think mm -hmm. it's the main reason we didn't act. Um, we being, you know, governments, not in individuals. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't act. <laughs> I, I dropped the ball. <laughs> it's me personally. But the, the double edge of the legacy of neoliberalism and climate change is not just that we don't act, but we also systematically starve the public sphere so that when climate change really starts to bite, the bones of our public sphere are, are crumbling all around us. And, you know, what I'm not like I'm not a lifelong environmentalist. I, I'm somebody, you know, as you know, Francesca, like I was writing about economic justice and globalization and. You know, I wrote a little about the environment, but I sort of thought of climate change as like the big green groups are dealing with that, you know. Right. Um, and my wake up call was Katrina, um, as it was, I think, for, for a lot of us where you saw this exact thing, heavy weather of the kind that's linked to to to, to climate change slamming headlong into levees that should have been repaired. There were warnings and warnings. And of course, you know, the levees weren't prepared. The government is nowhere to be found. FEMA can't seem to find New Orleans for five days. People are abandoned in the Superdome. Um, and so this happens every single time. So that's what it looked like in, in New Orleans. And obviously it's intensely racialized, which neighborhoods are protected, which neighborhoods are not protected, as it is in Texas. It's black and brown communities that are on the front lines of the worst impacts invariably. Right. I, I mean, think about, think, about, think about Puerto Rico and Maria, right? Uh, you have austerity, the legacy of austerity and colonialism intersecting with this record-breaking storm. That's what's lethal. It's not just the storm, right? Yeah. It's storm plus 
systematically neglected infrastructure. So in Texas, you know, it was it was cold, not hot. Um, is, that's the big difference. Uh, but Texas has been experiencing this in the context of, of super uh, of of hot storms as well, right? In the, in the mm. context of hurricanes because of warming uh, that are made more intense because of warming oceans. Um, but yeah, you know what happened in Texas. Um, yeah, y- y- you had deregulation uh, um, gone mad. Uh, free market, you know, will deliver everything better for us. Um, you had private companies that were never told that they had to winterize their infrastructure, um, and yeah. they knew there was they weren't they never had to calculate for that. That wasn't part of the business model, nor did the regulators yeah. actually make it so. Yeah. Yeah, they were counting on a bailout of some kind. Naomi, do you get $5 every time someone says disaster capitalism? (laughs) I think Naomi Wolf gets it, actually. It's some sort of confusing thing. Oh, (laughs) my wife is named Naomi. She does not get $5. (laughs) Um, Dude, there's a big difference there. That's not right. Let's start a Patreon for disaster capitalism. (laughs) Uh, I mean, it's so interesting, right? Just a few years after Maria... Uh, not even. And it's like, oh, that old electricity grid oh, over there in Puerto Rico, you know, and our yeah. like little uh, forgotten kid brother over there. And then it happens in giant ass Texas to everyone, including Ted Cruz, you know, um, and it, happens oh, have, yeah. in, in blue state, California, like California burns down every year. And then there's yeah. a couple weeks where we can't go outside because we can't breathe. And uh, because the utilities don't maintain power lines near trees. And right, then, right. And they don't they don't bury them and they don't do any of the things that would cost more money. Um, yeah. So it's not working out that well. Yeah. I mean, and, and this is the question. So I was just there was a Wall Street Journal uh, report, a good one, uh, or I think. Um, but it, it showed that actually that, you know, the idea that Texans um, power bill was going to be linked to the market actually has been charging them way more. So it's they've been paying twenty eight billion dollars more for power than people in other states, which is insane. I mean, it's sort of I hear you, NATO, like if it. It, it, you know, it, it happens here in California, but at least we're not paying that much. At least we're not paying like, you know, um, record percentage percentages higher after having no power for, you know, a week as folks in Texas are. But I guess my question is also yeah. like, what do, what's the problem then with leaving energy rules to the market? And, and in some ways, maybe even going beyond that, like beyond regulation, like where should we really be thinking in terms yeah. of energy and decentralization and and protecting ourselves against uh, against what we know is is coming and present climate disaster mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um okay i'm gonna answer that question but one yes. thing i just one point i want to make before yeah. is just i think the difference with texas and maria uh in puerto rico and and, and katrina uh way back when in, in, you know, in 2005 is that those really were examples of the shock doctrine in the sense that there was a pre-existing agenda in all of those areas where there was huge antipathy towards public sector uh, um, uh, uh, parts of the economy. So in in New Orleans, there was a pre-existing desire to get rid of a whole bunch of public housing, which was on very valuable pieces of higher ground in New Orleans that sustained very minimal damage. So immediately after the storm, there was this push, let's uh, we'll get rid of, you know, I, there was this horrific quote from a Republican lawmaker, we couldn't clean out the public housing, but God did, right? Um, yeah. mm-hmm. and, that, and, they, and they did that. I mean, they, they, they used the fact that New Orleans residents were scattered all over the country. Many of them boarded onto buses at gunpoint um, given one way tickets a- out of their city with no way to return home to, cl- to, to demolish public housing, put up, you know, gentrified townhouses, and also faithfully to close all the public schools and reopen many of them as charters, fire all the teachers, get rid of the unions. I mean, a horrific case of union busting. Um, in, in Puerto Rico, uh, despite all the austerity, there's still a fair bit of the economy that remains in public hands, including the electricity sector. So before Maria had even made landfall, 
we were reading in places like the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, what they really need to do is privatize the electricity system. Right. Yeah. Right. So the thing that makes Texas unique, and you know, you said that the, it, it buried the invisible hand. We'll see. I mean, I just immediately pictured like a horror movie of like the hand reaching yeah. up through this frozen <laughs> snow. I mean, never, never say it's buried. It comes back yeah, yeah, up yeah. for sure. Um, but you know, in Texas, they did it all. Like there's not much left to say like, oh, this is our big moment. You know, they privatized, they deregulated, they did the wish list. And that's why it, it, we're in this moment. And in the Wall Street Journal is going, maybe deregulation didn't work so well. Very reminiscent of like, um, you know, the, the, the Alan Greenspan moment after 2008 going, the fundamental flaw was I had this, I thought that derivatives were going to regulate themselves, you know? Not bad. <laughs> I remember that. I was like, what? Yeah. Oh, that's your legacy, bro? Cool. Yeah. So that's that's more like the moment that we're in. So what, what the problem is with leaving energy in the hand of the market is that what a profit-making company seeks to do is, 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 is get maximum return on its investment to invest as little as you can get away with to get the maximum returns. So you're going to try to wring out as much profit from consumers as possible while investing as little as you possibly can get away with um, to get to get that return. And yeah. so the you know that's what they did. They they did as little as possible. Um, they thought that you know they they basically gambled that they that they they were never going to face a, a weather event like this, and they got it wrong. Yeah. And now and they're and hiking. They're hiking, um, as you know, they're they're massively increasing people's rates. Yeah, it doesn't seem like they're learning. Like there, you know, there's a hearing now in Texas, so yay. There's a lot of it's like that Batman or not that Batman, the Spider Man meme of like everyone pointing at one another. Like you were supposed to regulate. You're supposed to tell me to regulate. I don't know. Uh, you know. So uh, the hearing is going on in Texas. We'll, you will know, find out. Um, but actually, spinning off. Forget my last question. I got a better question, which is about your your article and what you just said, which is, you know, they don't have any more ideas. And that's why you see Governor Greg Abbott going after the Green New Deal is essentially what you laid out in, in that op-ed was, um, as you put it, there's no more ideas lying around when it comes to the free market and ways to solve this by privatizing things. Um, they're just ideas lying in ruin, as mm -hmm. you said. And so now they're going after the Green New Deal because it's sort of the last thing they have left is to make this, in my opinion, well, yeah. to sort of red bait. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that and sort of where we, where they're seeing, you know, are they okay, seeing like the, the, the walls closing in? Well, look, they know that times of crisis are times when, you know, things change quickly as well they should, especially when it's a crisis that is not an inevitable crisis, but is a crisis born of some very specific things that we understand deregulation, lack of investment in the public sphere meets a climate catastrophe driven by digging up the very thing that Texas is most known for, which is fossil fuels. So they're terrified that somebody might come along and not just have an opportunistic profiteering solution, but actual solutions to these underlying problems. And the Green New Deal is precisely what Texas needs because the Green New Deal is about investing in the public sphere in order to get off fossil fuels as quickly as humanly possible. So given that they don't have anything to offer, they are trying to wildly shoot at the obvious solutions to their problem because they're doing the bidding of the oil and gas industry as right. they always are. I mean, it's not complicated what's going on in Texas, right? So, um, you know, I think they're they're ter they're terrified of renewables because renewables um, are way harder to control with just a few small players, right? I mean, the thing the thing about renewables is not that it necessarily has to be in public hands. Um, it lends itself to decentralized forms of ownership and diverse forms of ownership, like municipal ownership, um, a commons approach energy cooperatives, the inputs are everywhere. The sun and the wind are everywhere. Um, and, and that makes it a very different kind of energy source than fossil fuels, which are only in particular places. And it costs a lot of money to dig them up. It costs a lot of money to transport them. It costs a lot of money to refine them. So a system like that lends itself to a few big monopolistic players. That's yeah. often why um, they like nuclear, because nuclear is structured very similarly. And so you can have the same kind of corporatist corruption that fossil fuels lends itself to 
the hope with renewables is that we could have energy democracy and we could have you know much more uh, much more public ownership, much more nonprofit ownership. Um, and you know your customers are your competitors because you're generating power off your rooftop. So obviously they don't like that. Oh, of course. I was Can just I, gonna, yeah. As, as I was just gonna say, I went to like I was in the middle of Joshua Tree, and there was like I was in some you know yurt as you do, and there was a guy, and he was like, he, you know, he was renting the place, and it was this Italian guy, and he was he was very. He was had, like, it your dad? He was not my dad. No. Um. Anyway, he was this guy, and whatever he said, he was my dad. No. Um. But he had a. They were in the middle of nowhere, and they had a solar panel, and I was like, oh, that's amazing. So you generate your own energy. He was like, no, we can't. We have to connect to the grid. We're not allowed to cr just create and use our own energy without connecting to the grid. We have to pay PG&E at some point. You know, we have to like do the yeah. whole rigmarole to get like a write off to get the, 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 the like, yeah. I don't, I'm not fully up on the solar panel thing, but that just seemed very ridiculous to me in yeah. sort of an example of what you're saying. Nevada you know, is another place that where they've waged war on, on, on this kind of. I'm decentralized. So, so my, I mean, th th that to me that raises like uh, I wanted to ask your thoughts about sort of what the 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 uh, strategy question that um, you know yesterday the House passed the stimulus bill including a fifteen dollar minimum wage and we're now you know almost a decade into the fight for fifteen and there was like a pretty conscious strategy of going through local and state governments to pass fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage and sort of push it up to the federal level and. Um, what are your thoughts about like the sort of relative priority around you know climate change and the Green New Deal of sort of focusing all energies on a on a national fight um, as opposed to sort of like you know the the there there are local pieces mm -hmm. that could be done like we could think about a local Green New Deal but it also gets like super small and technical really fast about like mm -hmm. we need to build bike lanes in this town and that seems like both helpful and also nowhere close to big enough um yeah, yeah. so how, how do you think about those kinds of strategic questions so i think i think we need to be doing it all um and i think, Damn I, think one, I was one afraid of, you were going to say that <laughs> one of the reasons one of the things we need to learn from the original new deal and there's many warnings and lessons to learn from from the exclusions from the from the systemic discrimination um, um but also from the centralization i you know i think that we what we need is i think from a federal government is very clear targets we need to we we need to set our carbon budget um, and we need to stay within it. We need to audit ourselves if we're serious about actually preventing truly catastrophic levels of climate change. We can't just set a bunch of targets and just hope for the best. Yeah. We, ha we need systems to keep ourselves honest. But I think wherever possible within those targets, we need to decentralize power to, uh, to not just to the state and, and, and city levels, you know, but to tribes, uh, to frontline communities. You know, we need, we need you know, I think that, that, that there's some good examples to learn from from Germany and the way that they structured some of their rollout of renewables where they had, for instance, 900 energy cooperatives, renewable energy cooperatives. Wow. Um, so, um, you know, just because it lends, renewables lend themselves to decentralization doesn't mean it necessarily will be decentralized unless we structure policy in order to encourage that. Right. Um, which but is said, runs yeah. in the face of, I mean, sorry, just to say like the, the, so much about renewables is like, well, there's so much money in it. So if you can just get the venture capitalists interested in renewables and it's like, no, 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 that's not what yeah. we need, actually. No, no. Um, it's just too important and we need to move too quickly for us to just gamble with market solutions. That doesn't mean there's no role for markets whatsoever, but it does mean that they are not the engine of this. We're not leaving it to them. Um, but I think it, 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 the big issue around, you know, do we do we push at the state level or are we pushing more at the national level is just money. You know, um, this is expensive. It is a tr it's trillions of dollars and it's only the federal government that's going to be able to liberate that kind of capital. Right. Yeah. Especially. And this is where things are. Um, this is where things are. um more difficult in the context of COVID is that so many states are in their own financial crises, right? Now we right. there 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 is finally funding going to states, um, but yeah, I mean, this is all of it. Does that make sense? All and I think you yeah, look I mean, skeptical, we, NATO. No, obviously the answer is Bitcoin. 
<laughs> oh, so, oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. I figured That's it out. That's what you were gearing up for. Yeah, okay, I'm too like, close to Silicon Valley. Uh, All we everything. need is some clever Bitcoin. You know what? They're doing such a great job in Puerto Rico right now that obviously we should just let them do their Oh, that was no. A joke. That was is a joke. that happening? Oh, yeah. That's what happened after Maria is like all they called them. They called themselves Puertopians and they went to Puertopia to go start their Bitcoin utopia and take advantage of all of the tax breaks. Um, and yeah. Oh, God, it's it's horrific. that's yeah. disgusting. Well, Cri so crypto colonialism, they call it in Puerto Rico. Oh, I love it. That's great. I mean, there, yeah. And, and I know there's been some really positive movements also in Puerto Rico and some good things that have come out of, of Maria too and the disaster there. I, I guess speaking on the thing you mentioned a little bit and what you just mentioned now in terms of this pandemic, like I've been thinking about you a lot during this pandemic because it's exactly as you said, sort of like exposing the failures of neoliberal capitalism and also what happens when you hollow out the government mm -hmm. and so it can't function anymore. What do you feel like I don't want you to play Nostradamus here, but you're so good at it sometimes of playing this sort of like, what do you think might happen? And Naomi what are the, Damas. <laughs> Naomi Damas, as we say. But what do Maybe you think? I should have a podcast. <laughs> exactly, please. You need a crazy purple background. You need a, a hat. Um, what are, I, I know we, what do you foresee happening, especially in the United States? Half a million people dead. We still don't have things like, you know, universal health care. Um, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. I guess I'm wondering, like, as you see the balance of forces, as you see sort of where we're at, like, what do you think, wh what lessons should we not let our electeds, let our, the powerful forget that we need to be learning coming out of this? Um, mm. And or, or, and or just sort of general thoughts on like, where you feel like we're going from here. I feel like there's a before and after of this pandemic, especially in the States. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this is a moment where just from a, a movement perspective, I think that we need more communication between movements. We need more strategy sharing between movements. I think it is very clear that the Biden administration is, um, despite some like early good signs, they are reverting back to Demo Democrats as usual and are going to lead us straight left to their own devices. Um, this would be this will be a one term administration and we will be facing a some sort of resurgent Trumpian project, perhaps without Trump, perhaps much more threatening. Um, but just left to their own devices, they are, you know, not going to do. They're they're gonna they're gonna screw people over on the on the minimum wage. They're gonna screw people over on their stimulus checks. Um, there's gonna be like, I mean, th this kind of w m militarism, but don't think about it and don't talk about it. Um, and it's just like I, I watch Tucker Carlson occasionally just to oh, really God. scare myself because <laughs> it's very interesting how he is more and more kind of playing this explicitly anti-corporate piece of the populist mm. card. Um, and you can just see every, everything, every, every way that the Democrats will fail, they are poised to profit from. They're not going to go back to being the Republican party. That is just openly the party of big business. They are yeah. going to refine what Trump did um, in, in the, in the, in the, economic nationalism, um, standing up to, to the globalists, all of that. Um, and we can see examples of this in Europe with Marine Le Pen and, and the way that whole discourse gets, get, gets um, folded together. So we have to be, we need to be really strategic in the outside of the Dem. We need to be very clear that we are not the Democratic Party. <laughs> we are not an extension of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and we just can't let them fuck it up because they will yeah. fuck it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that is going to require a much more confrontational kind of activism than, than we've seen so far. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I think it's, I, it's exciting that the squad is growing. I hope Nina Turner, I think it's important to get Nina elected. Having Nina in there will be really significant. Just more coordination inside the squad in terms of putting forward what an actual vision of a Green New Deal well, all, what the different pieces of legislation, you know, housing, care, um, yeah. energy, all of it. Like we need, we need the legislation to be pushing for. Um, and 
yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm frightened to be honest with you. Yeah. Like I, I am, I think we've got a very narrow window here. Um, and, but I, where I am heartened is I don't believe that we're repeating the 2008 mistakes of just like, maybe they need more time. And like, what the one thing I like about Biden is that nobody really likes Biden. Yeah, totally. Like, <laughs> There's none of this, maybe he's my boyfriend stuff with Obama, <laughs> you know, like, it's, yeah. just, uh -huh. it's like very clear. And, and I think that that's, there's the, <laughs> Jill Biden doesn't like Biden that much. <laughs> Clearly not. But that's healthy. That's healthy. It's good not to have a crush on the head of the most powerful imperial state in the world. But I mean, it's the perfect example of why for me, the pandemic is like you've been gifted. You've I mean, Trump was gifted an opportunity to do something. He could have had four more years. Are you kidding me? Easily. If he didn't fuck up the pandemic, in my opinion. I think it's very clear that if so many, especially seniors in the United States, weren't affected by this, he would get four more years. That's mm. where he lost. And and Biden, in unless, yeah, yay, yay, floating down lit candles to commemorate the dead. I, that actually does matter to me. Mm -hmm. But what matters even more is really like boldly stepping to this historic moment in a way that you know is going to not only tackle the virus of of, of the, you know, of COVID, but also of fascism. And yeah, I don't see him rising to that occasion either on just doing the basic things. I mean, I'm like, can we get some internationalism here too? Like you look at, let's look at other countries that have successfully stopped the spread of COVID. Can we, yeah. you know? No, but that's key. I mean, I think, I think American um, activists and journalists would do well to talk about the rest of the world a hell of a lot more. Um, yeah. and, uh, and it's the most powerful argument you can make that, that, you know, talk about Canada more. Canada's not perfect, but it's a pretty damn good argument, um, that you have very close by, um, uh, to, to make the point that this was not inevitable. Um, right. talk about China, you know, I mean, this is, it's just, it, I, you know, I think, Americans are always um, very inward looking and, and, you know, it's something I've, as a, I'm Canadian and American dual citizen, but, you know, my, I always saw my role as like trying to get Americans to like look out beyond the border a little bit and remember that there are other people out there. Um, and I think that during the Bush years, because of the wars, there was some of that. Right. Um but the Trump years have been very much like, okay, we are the most interesting show by far. Right. Like we're just gonna watch ourselves um, and the rest of you are not that interesting. Um, and that really needs to stop. We need to talk about vaccine nationalism. Um, and we also need to talk about where countries are doing things a lot better um, and use that as a tool. Absolutely. Bernie does a good job of that and he gets made fun of for it, but. You know, he does believe other countries exist. Maybe once we stop being the biggest train wreck in in on Earth, like we can start looking outwards. So I feel like because it's like, let's be real. The rest of the world was also looking at us in this time, too, being like, oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, and is I mean, that's the other thing that I think is important is for the world to stop seeing, you know, the United States as I mean, I don't think it does, but I think there is a stupid fascination once there was an article where it was like interviewing people around the world, just being like, I feel really bad for Americans, like in the middle of the pandemic about all the like our lack of response and Trump. I remember there was like someone in Thailand in a village going like, oh, man, <laughs> it's very humbling, very humbling and important. Yeah. When when we were in, in Cuba, like and people would find out that we were Americans, Cubans would always be like, uh like th like there was this like cautious question about like so how do you feel about your government right now and we'd be like oh no, no no we hate trump too and they'd be like phew okay are you okay then do you need <laughs> asylum here God. yeah it was uh, yeah um i wanted to ask you about your most recent piece in The Intercept about um, how Modi and the BJP is sort of weaponizing big tech against dissent uh, in India and, and the massive farmers protests and um, specifically the arrest of a 22 year old climate activist who was held for nine days and um, was released this week. But how 
I guess my question, I mean, this sort of interplays because when nationalist governments control the narrative, it's very hard for us to have that internationalism. It's very hard for us to break through the misinformation. So yeah, I guess how is that happening in India from what you've been researching and, and maybe how that relates back to, yeah, these tech companies that are US based? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think that there's in a weird way more internationalism on the right right now than the left. Um, in the sense of like really swapping strategies and you know Steve Bannon's flitting around the world yeah. connecting people with all it's like worst practices like what's the worst thing you're doing in Israel okay great let's move that to India and it's like well what about China I like what you're doing with the internet let's try yeah. that you know <laughs> um, and then like you know Trump and Bolsonaro and you know it was it's a club and Duterte and they're really swapping strategies and What's interesting looking at what's going on with tech, right? Is Talk about a white elephant sale. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll see myself out. <laughs> he does um, that. Okay, got it. Um, so, yeah. So, the, I mean, what's interesting about what's happening with the tech companies in India is you have this kind of double digital jeopardy that you see really clearly in the, in the Disha Ravi case, who's that 22-year-old um, climate activists, where on the one hand, you have Modi's troll army, and he's really, really good at it. And Facebook um, sees India as an incredible, is its most important market, right? So wow. the backdrop for, uh, there's only two countries in the world with more than a billion uh, tech, potential tech users, that's China and India. They've already lost China, right? Because of sort of early Silicon Valley, um, some of it was idealism, some of it was shame, they used to have shame. Um, and so there were a few like high profile cases, I don't know if you remember this, but like, yeah. it turned out that um, Yahoo uh, helped the Chinese government identify a dissident, like some like, like somebody posted something that that they didn't like. And, and it turned out Yahoo gave gave the Chinese government their IP address, this became a huge issue. Um, Google as well was um, what was cooperating at the beginning with um, the Chinese government censorship. And then their, what used to be their slogan, don't be evil was kind of jujitsu against them and their, and, and Google employees uh, objected. Right. And bottom line is most of them left, right? And Facebook was never there. And China developed its own tech companies that now rival Silicon Valley, right? And mm -hmm. those companies are able to do things um, that they're not able to do in the US, right? So there's more smart cities, there's more surveillance, there's all the like creepy um, uh, choreographed dances on TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's also like that, you know, the app that does it all, right? Like you've got your, you've got total integration of, of payments, banking, cashless, whatever, all that. So Facebook sees India as the market where they're going to be able to do that, which they, they haven't, they, they're not going to be able to do it in the US. The US, they're talking about breaking them up, right? So they see India, which is already Facebook's largest market by users, as the place where they're going to um, do all the things that China is doing that they haven't been able to do in the US. Now, the price of this is they have to um, give these um, uh, these the, these Hindu nationalist politicians the ability to post whatever kind of hate they want um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on on their platforms and 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 it's really kind of genocidal language that's being used like for instance there was a big campaign <clears throat> that was like hashtag Corona Jihad which was this um, claim that that Muslims were deliberately spreading COVID wow um, and so I mean. I have um, friends who, who are Trump, activists in India Trump who would have thought of that one, right? Like that's very kung flu esque. For sure. Anyway. But 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 you know, the, like how many documentaries have there been with like Facebook executives wringing their hands about the Rohingya massacre and 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 saying, well, we're not going to let that happen again. We're really on it. You know, we're we're like like they they recognize that they played a role in a genocide. Yeah. You know, I have friends in India who are describing what is happening in, in, in describing India's market as a pre-genocidal market that it can tip in at any point, and and there and and so it's not just about online hate; it's about online hate tipping very 
frequently into offline pogroms. This is already happening in India. Um, and so the price of admission is free reign to the, to the BJP politicians who want to spread this kind of hate. And, and this is the pincer of it, because so it, it, it is you have to cooperate with the government when they, when they ask you to give them a backdoor to the messages of you know, activists and, and farmers and so on. Or and deplatform whoever we say. So Twitter has um, has 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 killed the accounts of something like fifteen hundred uh, um, uh, accounts that are linked to the farmers' protests. Google apparently has cooperated with giving um, the Indian the the Delhi police uh, information about the, who edited a Google document that Greta Thunberg tweeted an entirely benign clicktivist do document telling people. And Google was the one to actually give that information out. Well, that's um, what the Delhi police claim. Google didn't answer my request for comment on this. Um, they have not said a word. None of them have said a word. Like, mm. and it's, and it, it is scandalous that they're, that they're so silent when their tools are being used to hunt down young climate activists. Zoom also, the Delhi police is like, yep, we've asked Zoom to tell us who was in at a particular meeting, who participated. Um, and once again, I asked Zoom for comment. Zoom sent me uh, you know, an email referring me to their corporate policies, which say we follow the laws of, any, of, of every country where we operate. Now, um, in the, the other thing that happened is that India passed a new set or, or uh, just announced a new, um, a new code that will regulate digital media that says that if you post something that questions the integrity of India, which I'm pretty sure we've just done, um, <laughs> uh, then, you, then you have to take it down within 36 hours. And if you get a request for some kind of cooperation information on whoever posted it or, the, or where it originated from, you have to cooperate within 72 hours. So this is Chinese level, yeah. um, you know, hunting down of, of, of unpopular opinion. I mean, so I, it's not dissonance. It's like anyone who says something they don't like. They, they talked about mischievous content. I mean, what? I mean, this well, is. I'm really sure they'll serious. ban all these. You know, they'll ban them all once the capital is stormed and you know politicians' lives are threatened. And uh, if they do hang the vice president, then maybe then they'll be banned from Google and Twitter and Facebook. And only then, be like, all oh, right, fascism's kind of the same everywhere, isn't it? Well, it's it's. It, I mean, the truth is these guys found their moral compass when it looked like Trump was on the way out and they were afraid that Biden was going to regulate them. So they're doing one thing in North America where they're like, oh yes, yes, you don't have to re regulate us. We have the Supreme Court of Facebook that's coming online and, we, and we're and we doing all of our own fact checking, so don't touch us. And in India, it's like, we what do you want us to do? We got everything. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. Got that. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I, I live... <laughs> I, I can walk to Mark Zuckerberg's house from my house. Mm -hmm. Is there is there anything you would like me to say to him? I can go I can go over there right now and have a you talk. You can also with walk him. to Nancy Pelosi's house, NATO. Was that, that you who spray painted the circle A on her uh, garage? That's a little bit of a longer walk. Like Zuckerberg is like in the same zip code as me. Pelosi's across town. I'm not in that kind of shape. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to get a get a eat a uh, go bike or something. <laughs> uh. Um, Naomi, anyway, they're bad. That's the bottom line. These tech yeah. companies, bad news. They're bad news. And, and absolutely. I mean, this is what it feels like. It feels like, um, uh, it's a little bit of a puzzle. All of this is a puzzle. And, uh, and that first sort of, you know, um, piece that we have to unwind here does really feel like it goes through tech it, because it feels like yeah. it goes through information and it feels like it goes. And that's at the heart of democracy in and of itself and truth, it, which we've all seen unfold under like horrifically in front of our eyes under the Trump administration yeah. and then the pandemic. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. The first piece is breaking off you know, big tech, big media, and just being able to actually have truth somewhere, somehow. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think it's not just breaking them up. Um, it doesn't solve the underlying problem. The underlying problem is their business model. Um, yeah. The, 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 their business model is surveillance. Um, their business model is data extraction. The way to get the data is to keep people in a state of acute agitation and in so-called engagement. 
Um, and that's not going to change, you know. Um, hey, so the, please yeah. acute agitate with this post right now. <laughs> if you're listening, just like like five stars, all the acute agitation you can muster. Here's the thing is, is I mean, it's like, the, here's my thing about, about Facebook and the acute agitation is it's both like this insidious threat to democracy. And I am convinced that most of Facebook's revenue is people buying ads that are poorly targeted. Just because if I look at the ads that get served to me, Facebook believes that I am a, a, a HIV positive black gay man Zionist who with alcoholism, who collects horses and um, and has shaving problems. So, uh, <laughs> NATO, you've been buying the wrong leggings, man, yeah, on, I know. On, on the so, internet. That's so what happens like, when you buy crappy leggings. Well, I get, you get some, all these. Like, they, yeah. <laughs> I keep seeing these ads and I'm like, what? What what do they send you? (laughs) They basically think I'm so old (laughs) that they're practically selling me caskets. (laughs) That's awful. I'm just like, would you like this plot of old? But I'm not, I mean, they're they're like 40 years off, you know, how old they're actually trying to mark me. That feels like, that feels like some COINTELPRO shit where it's like, we (laughs) got any bad for my self esteem. I'm just like, (laughs) what? going on that's amazing um well thank you so much for joining us um this has been awesome and uh hey whenever you want to just like sound off i know you have all the free time but you are welcome back on the bituation room podcast i love the show and it was any day so fun to hang out and did you hear that i'm gonna clip that up and just you know go into any room be like naomi klein oh you don't know her (laughs) fuck you um (laughs) Don't want to be here anyway. Um, sorry, that's me in an executive meeting. I live in Hollywood now. That's those are my meetings. It's basically that. Um, thank you so thank much, you. Naomi. Be well, and please, everyone, read all of Naomi's books, especially the new book, which is for kids. And so, if you have kids and you've been quarantining with them, you know they need this because they're gonna they have to emerge like chrysalis right now and now they're emerging as a butterfly ready to you know start the rev and everything so do that do that naomi klein machete order you can't you don't go in chronological order you gotta gotta do the machete order oh is that backwards no that's this is like a whole thing on on the internet about like the right audience you know what i'm talking about the right order to watch <laughs> the star wars movies in that's not oh, the correct order oh do we have I a right you. order to read yeah. naomi klein's books in uh I, yeah, I think you. I think you want to start with this changes everything. Just like hit the ground running. Yeah, it's relevant now. Uh, oh my god, they've I, all the summers that I just got like a new Klein book, and I'm like, poof, 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 brain oh. explodes. Um, yeah, redefine life, redefined. Thank you. Thank be be you. very well. You're nice people saying nice things about books. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> they're good. They're they're good writer. Have I mentioned that? It, they're easy to read. Not everyone's a good writer. That's the thing about books. Um, it is the thing about books. <laughs> that's what you. That's what you the heard least, here first. The least you can do if you're going to write a book. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, all right, everybody, take care. Uh, Naomi, take thank care. you so much. Be very well. Uh, uh, thank you for joining thank- us. Uh, and I just cut her off, and that says that's going to be my legacy. NATO Green. We'll Hello. follow Nato Green, Mr. Nato Green, somewhere on Instagram, That's Twitter, right. all the things, all the things. Um, I'm glad you didn't profess your undying love for Naomi Klein because that would have gotten weird. I, I I'm not going to make it weird. Good. Any more uh, than normal. Any more than. <laughs> <laughs> you went into a bit there for a little bit. Yeah. For a, a bit. You went into a bit. Um, Nato Green, I'll see you in a week, buddy. Oh, are we talking in a week? You know what? A week from now, it's my birthday. <gasps> what I'm day? Mo- March. Is the yeah. day before birthday? It's my birthday, but the day before is my birthday, actually. Clearly, I can't do math. I think I, I, uh, d- March six. Hell yeah! Yep. All right. Well, uh, I'll have. Damn it! I got a gift now. <laughs> I'll think of something. I'll send a bottle. All right. Be well, my friend. Bye. Bye-bye.